For me, my earliest memory, Fortean TV, was on the 6th of July, 1975. And I can remember this very, very closely because it's the first time that I ever saw Bigfoot. Uh, I was ready for the encounter and I was poised and still and I had binoculars around my neck and a bowie knife on my belt and a Kung Fu dressing gown on because I was eight. And I wasn't in Oregon, but I was in a South Bristol living room sitting cross-legged in front of our Granada black and white with its luxurious 20-inch screen. I'm sure you all remember those. I was already obsessed with the abominable snowman, as it was then widely known. And so I got unreasonably excited when my dad told me that there was a programme on that coming Sunday featuring the Yeti. And I was delighted and I got the Radio Times and I ringed the entry about five times in crayon saying uh, for the world about us, which was called Monsters, Mysteries or Myths. And I waited for what seemed like a century until I found myself three feet from the screen, not wanting to miss anything. And, and I didn't miss a thing. I was absolutely wrapped. It's the first paranormal TV programme I'd ever seen. And sort of, you know, best part of 50 years on, I don't actually remember that much of the programme, but I very much remember the impression it made on me. Uh, and I'm pretty certain it was Attenborough. In fact, yeah, I think it was Attenborough. Uh, but then it always was for any nature documentary. Uh, and um, it was fleeting images of Nessie and the Spicer Lockside sighting, the surgeon's photo, which in those days was still regarded as primary facial evidence. Um, and then it went on next to snowy pictures of Himalayas and llamas and Yeti sculpts and heavily bearded men in Atanaraks looking at mountains. And then um, I'd never heard of Bigfoot before that, though. Actually, no idea. And uh, I remember it switched then from the Himalayas to sort of foresty vistas and people in Stetsons and pickup trucks and log cabins. And um, then there was this bit of forest and there was a, a gentle camera glide along a woodland path. And then suddenly, silent and shaking, there was Patty walking away from us, brisk but not bolting, brief look towards the trees and the camera, and then stepping over lion branches and off into the trees. Less than half a minute of actual footage. And that's all it is. We tend to forget that. Actually, the whole thing's a minute or so, but that, 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 let's, not, that, let's not go into that. It was utterly striking. And to a very young, impressionable cryptozoologist, it was, it was hypnotic. And at that age, actually quite frightening. And I must admit, even to this day, and I've seen it a million times now, it still gets a little bit of a raised hairs on the back of the, on the, back of the neck. Anyway, as Ken the Custom, it was shown again in slow-mo froze if that leads that, that that frame there 352 and this frame was the only segment of the film i saw again for many years and it was first of all in uh briefly in uh attenborough's bbc children's program which not many people remember which was called fabulous animals um which was at the end of 1975 and then not again till the following decade you got to remember this was an era which we had no internet and we didn't even have vcrs so if you missed it on TV, you completely missed it until, until it was repeated, if it was repeated. And as I was nine in 1975, I had very little control over what was watched on, the single, on a single television in the house. However, on the other side of the pond, while this was going on, something else was happening. There's something about Star Trek Part One. Long regarded as the daddy of all the 14 series, the original In Search Of ran for mm, do, 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 do five years and hosted by Trekkie favourite Mr Spock Leonard Nimoy and it gained a significant following. It was cut very much the pattern of documentaries of the time with Nimoy appearing at the top and tail of each episode and narrating and the rest of the footage consisted of testimony and reenactments and covered most of the greats. So UFOs, Nessie again, if New Hampshire had been discovered by the Welsh and it was Notable for its neutral stance, it just actually presented the facts as they repeated and as they were reported. Now, broadly, this approach was then mimicked by Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World, in which the seer of Taunton and inventor of the communication satellite, as they remind us every single week, uh, accompanied by footage of him sauntering along a beach before putting up his telescope on a beach in broad daylight. I don't know what he was looking at. No, never mind. Um, and here we are. Here was the seer of Taunton, and like Nimoy, Clark introduced the overall topic, but then he let Gordon Honeycomb do all the heavy lifting with the narration duties before Clark would rock up at the back. And, uh, and at the very end, he often does not tell us that he didn't actually believe in it in the first place. To be honest, they could have got my Uncle Jack, the old bloke from Somerset, who didn't believe in things. He'd have been a lot cheaper. He'd have done it for a pint. But anyway, as for British TV, by and large, that was it until the early 90s. 
and then the X-Files happened, and then hot on its heels in 1994. There's that, there's the van. Schofield's Quest. Sorry, I can't, because I'm trying to keep it, my, my machine's not keeping up properly. So I'm, I will try and keep the slides up. If it looks a bit shambolic, don't worry. This is entirely intentional and artful, of course. Schofield's Quest in 1994. Schofield's Quest with Philip Schofield. Look at him there, wasn't he young? Um, and Blue Peter Emeritus, Karen Keating. Uh, Brian Blessed shouting excitedly about Yeti, which he does to this day. You know, he, he's consistent. Crop circles with the 1960s ocarina botherer Reg Presley. And John Inman, I remember for one of them. Um, the whole thing was hilariously breathless. I'm going to give you a rough idea about what a 15-minute segment would be of Strofield's Quest. <clears throat> picture of the newbie ghost. Is that a picture of a ghost? If it is a ghost, it might be a ghost. Do ghosts exist? Well, if it do exist, that might be a picture of one. Is it a picture of one? We don't know. We can't explain it. It must be a ghost. Well, I never. After the break, we'll talk about Klunguska and then go to a Weetabix advert. It was actually no help at all to people like ourselves, but it was a nice shot window, I suppose, for Fortiana generally. But then something really, really jolted the whole scene, which a lot of us will remember. For years, rumours have been circulating about a very special piece of film. And in 1995, it all took off just a little bit. And what's instructive is the way it was handled on either side of the pond. And of course, we're talking about the alien autopsy footage. Da -da. On August 28th, 1995, Channel 4 broadcast the autopsy footage as a segment of the Roswell Instant as part of their secret history series, which often has not covered rather more sober topics, such as the confidential operations around D-Day, Cold War espionage, and other things, but occasionally it forayed into more 14 areas. Uh, in keeping with the series' usual format, it was pretty unsensational, just related the story and surrounding arguments pro and con, with comments from experts such as uh, pathologist Ian West and special effects specialist Bob Keane from Pinewood Studios, um, both of whom immediately pronounced it as a clever fake. And if you remember Bob Rickard uh, in the FT at the same time, immediately said, that's a clever fake. You know, a lot of us weren't really taken on. I think a lot of us, me included, for the first 10 seconds were kind of, yeah, what? Oh, God. So, you know. However, on the other side of the Atlantic, the first American showing was a lot less understated. There's something about Star Trek, part two. The footage stateside was enveloped in a Fox special fronted by Commander Riker himself, Jonathan Frakes, with the title Alien Autopsy, Fact or Fiction. Experts galore were weird on to pronounce upon its veracity, including a pathologist called Cyril Vecht, who said that procedures in the film looked technically authentic. Um, Stan Winston, the great um, special effects specialist, and cinematographer Alan Devio both turned up as well. And the whole thing was presented in such a breathless and uncritical fashion that its entire connotation was that here was proof of alien life. It had landed on Earth. And perhaps predictably, given the cultural atmosphere at the time, i.e. the X-Files, it caused an absolute uproar. In fact, such was its impact, the viewing figures actually went up on subsequent screenings, and they rescreened it a good two or three times. And the home video release actually sold in the millions. At one point, it was outselling the, the top-rated film of that year on video. It was that, you know, that much impact. However, behind the scenes, there were very deep misgivings about it. Um, John Jobson, who was the director tasked to put the other factors of the programme together, such as the interviews and stuff, told the producers from the start that he suspected it to be a fake. And following his interview with the film's promoter, Ray Santilli, oh yes, Ray Santilli, he became convinced that they were being duped. And the producers, however, had their eyes very firmly on the ratings, and they made it clear that any such suspicions would not be voiced, certainly not for the time being. And Stan Winston subsequently claimed that his interview was heavily edited to imply that he was unsure whether it was fake or not, whereas in fact he'd maintained from the very beginning it wasn't at all genuine. He could have easily replicated what was on the, uh, on the screen. And the UFO investigator Kevin Randall, many of us would know, had stated outright it was a hoax, which also didn't make the final cut. I mean, to this day, despite the main players in the footage themselves now having freely admitted it's a fake, there's many who still believe it's, it's genuine, as we, of course, have all seen. There are many people who still cite it as uh, Exhibit A. Hey ho. Anyway, 1997, 14 TV, marvellous, compared by this amiable old codger that we all know and love. It was from the same stable as Rapido and Eurotrash, with much the same fast editing, short snippets, self-consciously edgy commentary, 
and made much of the really bizarre end of our spectrum of interest. And of course, the good Reverend remains a fine ambassador for Forty and Thought. Uh, and as I'm sure you all know, the whole series was re-released on DVD last year to mark the 25th anniversary. And I'm very pleased to say it stands up extremely well. And I have the great pleasure, as some of you may have read, of interviewing Lionel about it beforehand. I've got to say, he's hardly aged a day. For a bloke who's about 140, he sounds exactly the same. Amazing man. And there's other, somebody else who actually never seems to age very much. It's uh, Chris Packham. Stop groaning at the back. I know he's divisive, but... I quite like Chris Packham. He's passionate about what he does. He's a strong advocate for wildlife and these are laudable traits. You do detect a butt, however. In 1998, in his series X Creatures, he set off around the globe on the track of cryptids, many of whom he'd already decided didn't exist. Rather than hunting them himself, generally speaking, he concentrated on eyewitness testimony, which is easier to argue about. He covered all the standards, Yeti, Thylacine, ABC, Nessie, but his real coup de grace, which many of us I'm sure remember, was an attempted debunking of the Patterson Gimlin film. And all credit to them, they absolutely went to town. They threw the kitchen sink at it, did not spare a penny. Just take that in. Can you tell the difference between Patterson and that? I mean, to be honest, casting Keith Harris's cuddles as Patty was never going to go well. Uh, they could maybe redeem themselves by using him to re recreate this. But then again, that was an opportunity missed, wasn't it? Around the beginning of the millennium, a distinct variety of fortune tellies started to appear. Sorry about this, Christian, in advance. Aided by the proliferation in cable and digital channels, suddenly the spectacle of people in infrared looking for oddness, either actively pursuing it or sitting passively waiting for it to happen, was everywhere. Tens of thousands of hours of this kind of stuff has since been shown on varying channels of varying appeal and quality, from the how are they still broadcasting, like UK TV pick plus one plus 24, with an average of 11 people watching it, to the outright and otherwise respectable, such as Animal Planet, although the latter has tried very hard to tarnish its own reputation in recent years, and we'll discuss this later. For British viewers, the first series to really popularise this kind of gonzo paranormal investigation was, well, of course, Most Haunted, in which Emeritus Blue Peter presenter Yvette Fielding, her husband Carl, the pantomime scouse medium Derek Degsiacora, Christian Johnson Romer, and various co-opted members of the film crew went to haunted places of repute around Britain and spent the night attempting to capture evidence on camera. Next day, the footage would be reviewed and a parapsychologist wheeled in to provide some semblance of balance. So far, so what? The fact that every single episode was replete with excitable shrieking and alleged evidence nearly caught on tape became the usual refrain, didn't it? Noise. Ah, what was that? Camera springs round. There's a vase on the floor, which I think we discussed last week in the Baltimore thing, ensured that most of the early adopters were broadly people looking for innate light thrill or um, sort of the light night channel flicking flaneur that teleshopping relies on so heavily. But after a while, word got around and it developed its own set of devotees. Many for the hilarious activities of Degsy, and not for nothing was the production company called Antics, but perhaps more worrying, many others without any shred of critical faculty started taking it all very, very seriously, particularly when it comes to the subject of orbs. Now, orbs, of course, depending on your need to believe, are either illuminated dust motes and or digital recording or artefacts, or their spirits in the residual. And, oh, they love residual, didn't they, most haunted? Ah, the participants at the first sight of these explicable little flying lights, and Derek would go scampering over and start communing with them via Sam, his spirit guide. And at this point, the full-on vaudeville of a chorus shtick would come roaring to life, wandering about a 400-year-old pub in an old part of an English town, and he confidently assert there was a man there called John, who was a father with children, and his eyes closed, his fingertips brushing his temple. Degsy took more counsel from Sam. He had a coat, and he sat in his pub drinking beer, and he had legs. Derek had a thing about legs. Anyone who witnessed his capering, gleeful rendition of a little girl dancing around a mossy tower somewhere will never, ever forget it. Often as not, there'd be a seance with the crew, the tumbler on the table spelling out some portent and other than conveniently backing up whatever Derek was shrieking about earlier on. But such activities were only the appetizer. The main course was yet to come. Split up in the twos and threes, on would come the green lighting or 
possibly blue. I'm colourblind, so you have to forgive me. Into this eerie atmosphere, the cast would station themselves around the place and wait for stuff to happen and then wait some more. Now, I've been on ghost hunts. A great number of you have been on ghost hunts, probably considerably more than I have. 99% of any ghost hunt consists of what? Bugger all. 99% of any ghost hunt is sitting still, getting chilly, wondering if you've got any coffee left in your thermos, until you emerge stiffly grey and shivering into the thin morning light, having heard an odd creak about 3.17am and absolutely nothing else, despite your heightened senses. But, and this is crucial, none of this makes riveting telly. So what does a producer have to do? Leave the tapes running and sincere hope that something happens to reward the viewer's patience in the knowledge that an hour of sod all in greeny or possibly bluey low light isn't very exciting and further is unlikely to provoke return visits? Or do they help it all along a bit, with or without the consent or indeed knowledge of the participants? We'll come back to this because this is quite an important point for Paramount TV. But in the case of Most Haunted, it pairs to bear in mind that two of the principal participants also produced it, which goes quite a long way to explain its mysteriously high phenomena hit rate. Um, the later leaking, of course, an apparent script, the revealing that, that, that Acora was faking sometimes, you know, uh, and, of course, scheduled inexplicable events. Um, well, either that was a masterpiece of truly overlooked clairvoyance or it's confirmation of what quite a lot of us, I'm afraid, suspected all along. By this time, however, like Roswell or, Bor or Borley Rectory, Most Haunted had a momentum all of its own, and no matter how damning any evidence against may have been, a core of true believers would accept no dissent. The sight of poor sod sad parapsychologist Kieran O'Keefe being booed in one of the live episodes, I think it was the one at Bewley, um, for daring to suggest there may be another explanation for a creaking stair, such as somebody walking on it, um, as opposed to a ghost called Henry, who, according to Akora, had more than a, one eye and a nose and occasionally wore a hat, uh, to the audience was clearly responsible for such anomalies. And I hope they paid a Keith well, or maybe it's just a masochist, I don't know. Anyway, Most Haunted ran initially for 14 series before basically ending in 2011, by which time the ratings had hit a decline, and, but it's since been recommissioned, I think, hasn't it? Before it departed, it spawned a whole mini industry, uh, stateside TAPS, aka Ghost Hunters, in about 2003, with the same basic premise, but a lot less camp, and within five or so years, any minority channel, you couldn't move for mediums. There's also a big discussion to be had about the difference between British and American uh, ghost hunting TV programmes, in that we tend to look for ghosts and they tend to be looking for demons, but that's for another day. Uh, part of its success was undoubtedly down to timing. 14 interest subjects are very cyclical, as we know, and when Most Haunted premiered, the whole UFO thing had died down again and ghosts were in the ascendant. But by 2012, the spooks were in decline and the beasties were on the up, and TV cryptozoology had arrived. Oh, Cora. Destination Truth, or more prosaically Monster Hunter, depending which side of the pond you're reviewing, started on the then Sci-Fi Channel, or SYFY as it's now known, as early as 2007. Initially, Josh Gates' intrepid team went all over the globe looking solely for anomalous beasts in bluey or greeny light, um, though they since branched out and now include other phenomena in their brief. And actually, they do a fairly honest job about it, I've got to say. In early episodes, Gates' voiceover came over as a shouty sub-chandler sort of smart ass monologue, but this soon became quite more subdued. And in fairness, when explanations can be found for anomalous footage, they are very quick to acknowledge it, and their adventures rattle along amiably enough. They did capture some quite interesting stuff too, not all of which was interesting, uh, instantly dismissible. And needless to say, none of it was conclusive either. As with any program that promises shattering revelations, if it were that significant, we, as in people with our scope of interest, would have heard about it a long time before it actually got broadcast. Um, but it does continue to this day and remains relatively unhysterical and quite measured. None of this, of course, can be applied to finding Bigfoot, proudly carried by Animal Planet. Finding Bigfoot is pretty much Scooby-Doo made life. The format never varies. The team of four are driving along in an SUV, all wearing natty fleeces, and they discuss where they're going. Matt Moneymaker, the BRFRO's leader and the Freddy of the band, will quickly explain they were there a few years ago and thought it was very squatchy. They then roll up to said area, immediately agree that, yes, it's squatchy. 
everywhere is bloody squashy. And whereas it's relatively easy to accept the possible existence of a large, ultra elusive mammal in the vast and 99% vacant Pacific Northwest, a presence in an area the size of my local Asda car park seems a little bit less feasible, I'm afraid. Anyway. I should add, they all agree about this except René, and René is a kind of extended Velma, who's a biologist and doesn't believe in Bigfoot, and therefore provides balance of some sort. Anyway, they then meet a local with evidence of some kind, a blurry, distant video clip, an indistinct recording of a howl, or etc., and immediately get Bobo, who's the Scooby-Doo of the group, to reenact it. Bobo toddles along with his arm raised above his head to indicate the height of the sighted creatures, which is always eight feet, which is coincidentally the height of Bobo with his hand up in the air. The others, except Rene, agree excitedly the witness must have seen a Bigfoot, as nothing else is that big, not even Bobo with his hand up in the air. And cue more locals with lo uh, more meetings with locals, weirdly bad CGI reenactments. They're terrible. Roger Corman would have bloody dismissed them. Then the obligatory wander about the forest in greeny, bluey light, walloping trees, howling, excitedly spotting things on the thermoscope that turn out to be cows or indeed one another. They all then agree, except Rene, that the place is squatchy, and that's the end of another episode. Add steroids and moonshine, and you get mountain monsters. If FB is Scooby Doo, mountain monsters is Stop the Pigeon. The team in this case consists of a hugely grizzled, impressively bearded men with thick Appalachian accents and guns who romp around the local area looking for cryptids of whom no one else has ever heard. There are honourable exceptions, such as the Grassman, who would be hard pushed to find any reference to any of the others. The locals have heard of them, though, so the team pitch off into the woods to look for them. And with strength of evidence similar to that of finding Bigfoot, they set about planning how to corner and snare the animal in question. The definite star of the team is tracker Wild Bill Neff, who's quite literally with Samity Sam, cleanest shaven and in combat trousers and a baseball cap. When predicting the success of the forthcoming hunt, Bill unleashes a torrent of southern gibberish. There he is. Uh, southern gibberish, um, punctuated by finger pointing and whoops and running about. There he is on his other side. Uh, they then set about building a different type of fiendishly complicated snare every week to capture it. A disguised cage, a giant mousetrap, a biplane that drops anvils, all the greats. And needless to say, they was completely failed to do so. And it takes an hour of oddly compulsive screen time each week. The, the formerly po-faced Discovery Animal Planet seems fit to commission this sort of material may seem odd. But then look at some of the stuff it itself has produced. We'll look at this a bit later on. Meanwhile, it's not all wacky races level gubbins out there. There's something about Star Trek, part three, in search of Spock. You wouldn't have forgiven me if I hadn't done that pun. You really wouldn't. To return to In Search Of. Given the recent resurgence in interest, a rebooted In Search Of was perhaps inevitable. With the original Spock sadly gone, there was only one obvious candidate to host it. The rebooted Spock. Zachary Quinto. The original series was cut far more to the pattern of documentaries at the time, with Nimoy appearing at the top and tail of each episode and narrating, whereas the reboot is somewhat more immersive um, with Quinto, who, like Nimoy before him, somehow manages to look even more like Spock when he's not in costume, actually rolling his sleeves up and hefting a shovel about, nodding thoughtfully when listening to an ever so slightly crazed witness and manfully resisting the temptation to declare an illogical captain. In episode two of the first series, Superhumans, which is a sly nod to another of Quinto's roles, Silar and the Heroes, he meets the usual suspects, a man impervious to pain, people who have found sudden immense strength in crises, and a Shaolin monk who can unflinchingly accept kicks to the groin and bend steel bars with his nostrils, and who in turn teaches Quinto how to break a wooden staff over his own head without staggering about afterwards, clutching his head and swearing. And it turns out to be good training when Seattle, we, we encounter Andrew Bazzaggio, the uh, founder of the Project Pegasus, who claims to have teleported to Mars, where he met Barack Obama, amongst other people. Quinto once again conducts the interview without clutching his head or swearing, although in conclusion, he does express a degree of disbelief regarding Pegasus's claims. Meanwhile, back in Blighty, 
If you crave rather more retrieve viewing, the Blaze channel has much to recommend it, depending on what you're looking for. If it's decidedly enthusiastic for it in material, then look no further. Um, it's got Monster Quest for a start, which is actually a very good balanced series and which I'd recommend highly. But there's not much to take the piss out of it, if I'm honest, so to be on really that superficial, then we'll just take a quick shift at the rest of the schedule. Um, Ancient Aliens is front and centre, of which more to come. Uh, however, the UFO Prog 2nd Division is strongly represented as well. There's things like um, UFO Hunters, Alien Chronicles, Top UFO Encounters. It's like low-rent women's magazines. And there's any number of titles featuring exactly the same words and indeed the same content, but in a different order. Slightly different pictures on the front. Other than that, same bloody programme. And in keeping with the current zeitgeist, that of official knowledge being greater than is acknowledged, each has a variation on the classic strapline. Is this proof that the government is hiding the truth? Aliens at the Pentagon announces Nick Pope, the UFO insider known as the real Fox Mulder of X-Files fame, provides shocking and revelatory insight. Spoiler, no, he doesn't. While UFO hunters are reverse engineering. Has the US military derived various forms of technology, including stealth expertise, from downed UFOs, again. And the latter, of course, leans heavily on Stephen King's long-lost brother, there he is, Bob Lazar, who has spun a whole industry based on two wage slips and a USA invoice saying, back engineer an alien propulsion system and make good. And the late Stanton Friedman, with his Ayatollah eyebrows beetling away as he raves about interstellar travel. The whole tone leads so heavily towards belief, well, it would, wouldn't it? And if you were entirely new to the field, a day on blades would make an acolyte of you. Most of the other titles are standard cheap paranormal telly fair. Is this very distant blurry footage really a craft from another galaxy? I'm pick one, you've seen the rest. Then we come to two seemingly interminable curse of series. Oak Island and Skimwater Ranch. Skimwater, Skimwalker Ranch. There's so much going on in the latter, it deserves a lecture or maybe a case conference to itself. But the former, based around the legendary money pit, is interesting because it's so narrowly focused. Cast your mind back, those of us with long memories, 50 odd years ago, the money pit was a 10 foot square shaft, beloved of the Reader's Digest, that magically flooded every time alleged treasure hove into view. Well, nowadays, in a sort of Jacques Tati style escalation, over the nine and counting series of Oak Island money pit, um, two prospecting brothers graduate from shovel and pick and archaeological caution to the use of industrial dragline diggers. And now the entire shaft has become an open cast mine slightly bigger than the original island. And they still found, well, bugger all. But you've got to give them, you know, credit for trying, if nothing else. Anyway. There's something about Star Trek. Part four. Here we are again. We've done spot fronting in search of. We've done Riker doing aliens. We've done spot fronting in search of. Now it's Kirk's turn. And there's clearly a quality to the children of Roddenberry that leans them, lends them to Fortean TV. Despite his relatively late start, Captain Kirk has put a strong showing in recent years. Shatner is a draw. These programmes all tend to just let him do his thing. Mm. Equally, None of them mentioned the anomaly that's his hairpiece, which is perhaps a professional courtesy. The Unexplained with William Shatner. He's very much the host in this one, linking, walking, and my favourite bit, talking quizzically in the black studio with animated backdrops, each episode following a loosely defined theme. In the series one episode, Mysterious Stones, the criteria is spread pretty wide, managing to incorporate topics from Mecca, to Crystal Skulls, all narrated in his trademark delivery, which, of course, as we all know, is very much that of a small child reading back words as he writes them down. Set into the Kaaba, a black stone. He's fabulous. The Crystal Skulls segment focuses on the Mitchell Hedges one, this being the name of the discoverer, not a defunct cigarette brand that used to sponsor it like a 1970s Formula One car. Of course, for those of a certain age, said skull will always be associated with Arthur C. Clarke's mysterious world. However, in this programme, the skull takes a less iconic role. And rather surprisingly, at one point, Indiana Jones is cited as a historical reference. But to compensate for his tardiness, 
Shatner is romping along. Not only do we have the above, but also weird or what with William Shatner and the one off special. William Shatner meets the aliens. All right, then. William Shatner meets ancient aliens, which leads us, of course, inevitably to ancient aliens. Right back in the days where we started, half a century ago, Eric Van Daniken wrote a book about how the human race evolved as it did because of people from space. So successful was it that Van Daniken rewrote the same book another half a dozen times, each volume elaborating slightly upon his previous unsubstantiated works in a manner that gave William Ockham an attack of the vapours. Another example of the kind of Fortean themes lit that breaks through into the mainstream, it made enough people not normally interested in our kind of stuff go, well, there must be something in it, to which we can reply, yes, several million Swiss francs. A few decades later, somebody noticed and launched the career of the hero of a million memes. Yes, there he is. Giorgio Sukalos and his hair, although in the early days his barnet was merely remarkable. The programme states its claim straight away in episode one. Aliens! In a trice, we're on to exhibit A, the Saqqara bird, a bird-shaped carving found in the Padlimen tomb in 1898. 1898. Its outstretched wings are apparently evidence that it's a scale model of a full-sized passenger-carrying glider, or possibly a bird-sized model of a bird, but this isn't stressed especially. It lacks tail elevators, any evidence of a power source, but that doesn't matter, as the logic is pursued that as it must be a glider, it needed motive launch energy, and as the aliens lapped cars or bungee ropes to launch it, it must be aliens. But it must might just be a toy bird a junior pharaoh could lob off the top of a pyramid for fun, isn't he mentioned? The coincidentally named Robert Frisbee, ex of NASA, waves a child's gyroscope about to explain Vimanas. It was aliens, obviously. And Sukalos, meanwhile, looking natty in his tweed jacket and tie, he points out the pre-Columbian artefacts are eerily reminiscent of modern fighters, while we're being pointy and triangular, having wings and things, cue helpful footage of a fighter. Obviously, then, it was aliens. Once again, the series-wide insistence that an ornament or a plaything must be a scale model of something else much bigger pervades, rather than acknowledging it might just be a toy dreamed up by societies that openly took recreational drugs. Either that or the producer has seen Clato and Gort in real life, but is keeping quiet about it. The whole thing romps along with its gish gallop, flinging multiple nuggets to the viewer and leaving little time to counter before moving on to the next pronouncement. And it's continued to do this for 16 series and counting. Never waste a good grift, even if you yourself completely believe it too. Which leads us on to Ghost Watch. Now, I, I, I wrote a whole thing about the retrospective about Ghost Watch, you may have read in the FT, and Stephen Volk and I had a long conversation about it. And um, the fact is, of course, well, why do people fall for it? Again, I think the, the timing was amazing. A lot of people watched it, expect, they didn't know what to expect. You know, even though it was Halloween, and Stephen Volk told me there was only two times it could have been shown, the producers refused to show it, any other dates on October the 31st or April the 1st. It also hit a kind of zeitgeist in that enough people at that time, and bear in mind this is 30 years ago now, um, the Enfield haunting was still in people's memories, as indeed was the Viterbo horror. And it kind of drew on that, really. The fact that it used authoritative TV journalists and sort of lifetime television presenters. Parkinson wasn't associated with April Fool's jokes. Smitty and Sarah Green, ditto. Uh, and fair play to Craig Charles playing himself as an absolute knob end. I mean, well done. He did pretty well there. But as a result, it's a very, very well put together thing. And they didn't anticipate the kind of impact it was going to get. However, you watch it again now, it actually again stands up very, very well. Even though I knew what to expect when I saw it 30 years ago. And at the time, I was a 25-year-old rugby player drinking Guinness. I slept with the light on that night. My wife was on nights. Thank God she didn't see it, see that. She'd never, never, ever let me down again. Anyway, it's worth watching again. It's a you can get it, and it is available on DVD. And it's uh, well worth watching. There's some documentaries about it too. If you look on Stephen Volk's own site, uh, he goes quite into depth, depth about it. But yeah, damn good. Anyway, 
again, like the alien autopsy, however, it was fake and it was fully admitted it was a fake. And again, as Volk said about ghost fox, they could quite easily have put a red sign up in the corner every five minutes going, this is a fake. However, people wouldn't believe it. Why do people fall for it? You know, well, as I've still said, the, the personnel. But I've, you know, generally speaking, people want to believe this sort of stuff. And I've already mentioned mountain monsters. And that, that it became increasingly clear once you went through mountain monsters series after series, it wasn't just exaggerated. It was actually definitely fake. Um, the telltale introduction to any paranormal series of a narrative uh, with shadowy figures following them and a badly constructed supernatural story arc with Native American guides and um, government shady people and so forth and so on. Uh, and but all else with mountain monsters, if you look at the credits at the end, it actually says no animals were hunted in this series. And a few eagle eyed viewers have pointed out that in fact the guns aren't even loaded in many, in many cases. You know, it's, it's artfully done stuff. So why on earth a discovery, an animal planet, starting to show alarming form in this direction? Some of you may have seen the Mermaid directory, uh, documentary a few months, uh, a few years ago, which was made up as fact. And it was actually very well made and took quite a lot of people in, I think, because it was so well done, so matter-of-factly done. Um, or the one about the Diatlov Pass incident that tried to implement, implicate a mank or an honesty um, as the perpetrator, incomplete with a fake photo of what appears to be a Yeti or an Armistead peering from behind a tree, which has now been adopted and now is all over the internet as proof. Even though Animal Planet have admitted they made it up, that doesn't matter anymore. It's, stopped, it, it's become a cultural artefact. It doesn't matter whether it's fake or not. It's become an artefact in itself, which is something we can discuss a bit later, if you like. Um, maybe they're trying to play, play with our minds a bit. Or maybe by showing this material alongside legitimate documentaries, they're blurring the edges of our world and how we perceive it. And I guess to finish off, this is, raises a question that we, I think, as people who investigate Fortiana and the paranormal have, be, have asked many times. What would happen if one of these low light live action Hanna Barbera Viragos actually captured some sort of evidence? Would we accept it as fact? Uh, and given Discovery's recent propensity to try and yank our chains a bit with a straight face, even if Discovery now said, Now look, no, honest, look, look, we've got some real evidence. No, we have, look, look. Would we actually buy it? Or would we just look on in interest like a Jenny Hanover in a jar of pickling alcohol on a shelf at Ripley's, and we'd acknowledge the intention, admire the artifice, but no deep down it proves nothing really than what we see ain't necessarily so. Whatever the colour of the light, blue, green, or bright sunshine, we don't know. Anyway, thank you for listening to my TED Talk. It has been a pleasure. I will stop sharing the screen. <laughs>